Perfect. We are recording. Well, welcome everybody. Um, Hassan, do you want to spend, do we want to give another minute or two for people? I see people popping up as they're joining here. Yeah, people are still joining. So let's wait uh, another maybe couple of minutes. Let's begin at uh, 105 Eastern. Sure, sounds good. Just three or four minutes. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Sean, I think uh, probably just good to go. So if you wanted to walk people through and then I'll take over when you're ready. Thank you. Yeah. Hassan, can you hear me okay? And I can see your screen okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's Sean Lancaster here from Altrix. I'm glad you could join us here, uh, obviously virtually, and, and we'll be running, we run these sessions quite frequently, as you know, especially on a weekly basis, we have a number of sessions that we run. Um, what I wanted to uh, share today are a couple of things. We're obviously going to go through our session today, but uh, we've had a lot of questions around, I think it's important to share some of the things that go on in the Altrix uh, community. So we've got the website that's that's up and running here, you can see it. Um, so a number of areas that, that folks always ask is where sh should we go into? And I'm, and I'm sure for a number of folks on the, on the call here today, you may have seen this already or gone through this today, but I just kind of like to share these things. And I won't go into these, these in details. We only have a, just under an hour, so I'd want to give the time to Hassan to go through everything today. But um, as you can see, these are just a couple of the areas, you know, more specific things around knowledge on. Hey, Sean, we uh, lost your audio here. It's just cutting in and out. Hassan, so, sorry, I'll do a sound check. Can you hear me or not? Uh, I can now, yes. Okay. You know, I apologize then, folks. We, we may have some type of connection issue. Maybe, Hassan, if you're able to take over, um, if it's coming from my end, I apologize. I don't know why. Uh, I've got full bars here full connectivity um can you take control then and maybe just show highlight altrix I don't, I don't hear anybody at all actually 
Yeah, absolutely, Sean, if you could just give me presenter control uh, and then I'll take over and then maybe you can just go on mute there. You guys here? Sorry, folks, we're uh, having some uh, technical difficulties this morning. Yeah. Right now, Hassan? Yep, sorry, so I still don't have presenter control there, Sean. Okay, looks like we lost Sean. Dimitri, you've got presenter control. If maybe you could just pass that to me, please. Yeah, thank you. Somebody just uh, told me there. Uh, Zach, your presenter. All right, perfect. We're in business. All right, apologies for that. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and quickly touch on a few things um, which I was, uh, which Sean was going to, and then we'll get into our um, kind of session building here. So today's workflow, uh, actually, before I get started, Dimitri, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can. All right, perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hassan Akbar. I'm a solution engineer here at Altrix, uh, based out of Toronto, covering uh, actually a lot of you from east to western Canada. So uh, thank you for taking the time to join our session today. I realize everyone's working from home. Uh, some have internet issues, uh, understandably. So what I'll do right now is I'm going to go ahead and cover a few things um, before we get the session started. I do want to let you know the workflows that I'll go through today are quite basic, um, but it will be me showing you versus you building along with me. There are a few concepts I did want to cover, and so I figured uh, maybe I'd just kind of go through it. But uh, before I do that, what, I, what I'd want to show you is a few things where you can start to gather some data as well, then enable yourself at your own time in much greater detail than I can provide you within the hour. So having said that, I know this is a predictive session. So today I'm hoping to cover uh, both regression and classification models and how you would achieve them within all tricks. Again, quite simple. Um, my intention today is not to teach you math and uh, I'm not a data scientist and I wouldn't do it justice. But having said that, what I'll do is show you where you can learn some of that math and what that would look like if you were to translate that into tools within all tricks. So what I've done here is just come to the all tricks community. Many of you are probably aware, so I'm going to spare you uh, kind of the details of the community. I will just We'll touch on this search bar here. So if you've got any kind of questions that um, you are maybe having some issues with or you want to explore or things that you want to learn, come in and leverage the search bar. You can search through our knowledge base. Uh, you can search through what other users are saying as well as the global community, which spans across uh, peers like yourself around the world, as well as some Alteryx aces and folks like myself that will come on and either share with you interesting things or respond to some uh, questions that uh, some of you may have. Uh, now, having uh, said that, and I, I've said that about 10 times, uh, I'll just navigate here to the Academy section. A few things I want you to kind of take a look at in terms of enabling yourself. So we've launched this new learning paths uh, area here. So what I'll do is open this up in a new tab. As well, then I'll open up the videos in a new tab, and we'll get through both of those in right now. So in the learning path, what you'll notice is specifically for if you're doing some advanced analytics or predictive, we've built this data science learning path. So if you were to click on that, what this will do is walk you through several methodologies within the data science um, kind of areas, if you will. Uh, what I tell you is come in and start off here, uh, exactly how the, how the um, session tells you to, and this will introduce you to some predictive modeling concept. So for example, if I click on predictive modeling, what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and describe what is a model? How do you start by creating a model? What are some of the important questions you want? 
um, how should you shape your data and even cleanse your data for modeling purposes versus what you would have done in the past, which is maybe some insights or analysis or, or reporting purposes. So I'd encourage you at your own time to go through these. I've gone through some of them. I find them very helpful. As a matter of fact, I went through a couple just for this session to be able to um, understand some key concepts which I can translate uh, to you. So I'd highly recommend you go through this. Uh, as well then, we have the video section, again, off the Academy. If you haven't already, I would tell you to come into the video index training area and bookmark this page. So here, what you'll find is, I'll zoom in just a tad bit, or a little too much here. Uh, and what you'll find is we've got some sessions by title, by when they were last updated, the topic that they'll cover, as well as the difficulty covered. So for example, if you wanted to do some predictive, um, what you can do is leverage your search on your browser and come and look for predictive analytics. So here's one that uh, I believe Andy Main went through a couple of weeks ago, which went through some employee attrition. Uh, use case and in this case our partner slalom has helped us build this so if you click on a particular session you'll find that we have a video and it's usually hosted on youtube so you can either watch it here or click on the title and it'll take you to youtube where you can start to watch this video at your own time as well then if you scroll down further you'll get a description of what that video will cover and then where it makes sense you'll see that we have workflows attached so in this case we don't but if i cover a, or sorry, you opened up another one. So you wanted to do um, another intro to predictive, for example. And you open that up. Again, you'll see the video, the description. And then here, what you have is a completed workflow. So you can simply download this. And if you pop it open, uh, it'll pop open an Alteryx instance in which you can start to see uh, how this workflow is set up. Uh, as well, then perhaps you can leverage some of that workflow for your own um, building. So th in this case, it was a YXDB. So what it did was it opened up a uh, data set here. Uh, I am going to use this one data set for one of my use cases. Uh, so you can come back here and download it after the fact. So those are your two kind of self-enablement uh, areas, which I encourage you to come out and visit. As well, then specifically for advanced analytics, we have a course. Um, that I will post a link to within our chat, but I think it's important to cover. So if you went over to the Alteryx community under resources, uh, you'll find self-paced training and predictive training. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the predictive training. And what we have is a predictive training. It's a macro course or a nano degree, whatever you wanna call it on Udacity. So I would highly encourage you to come out and finish as much of this, if not all of it. It'll introduce you to the mathematics behind predictive to a, to a degree, as well then translate that into tools within Alteryx, which you can start to leverage right away. So I've been at Alteryx for about a year and uh, a few months now. The, before I did my first predictive session, I can tell you this helped me a lot. So not only will it introduce you to the tools, but actually the concepts and the various classification models, some of which I'll touch on today. Uh, leveraging some slides. Um, I'm going to pause here for a sec, also tell you kind of the, the rules. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. Um, if you're leveraging the Q&A, please do not send me questions privately directly to me. If you're going to send me questions or have questions, uh, please send it to all the panelists that are on. Um, they will see it. I don't always have a view when I'm sharing my screen and they'll stop me and or answer your question wherever that makes sense. So I'll pause here for a sec. Any questions so far? Hey, Hassan, it's Sean Lancaster. Sorry, I'm intermittent here. Uh, I just wanted to also highlight um, Analyticon, uh, for those who may or may not have been before, which is our is our user conference that we hold annually, has now been updated and reposted for a new date, obviously based on, on what's been happening in the world. Uh, so it's January 18th, thanks Hassan, to the 21st. And now that is, has changed, the venue has changed to Las Vegas, as you can see in the screen here. We just wanted to highlight that uh, as well for folks. Sean, good point, thank you. Uh, also, for those of you that might not know what Analyticon is, it is a new uh, version of, I believe we were calling it Inspire last year. So it is now Analyticon. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the name just yet, but I do love the logo. Uh, so as Sean uh, mentioned, uh, we are moving this to January of 2021. 
uh, unfortunately, we can't have it uh, as intended in uh, New Orleans in June. So we look forward to seeing you in Vegas. I know it's a little ways away, but we'll have some fun when we get there. All right. So having said that, what I'm going to do is let me just pop into my presentation here. And I'm just going to dive right in. And so what I'm going to cover today, uh, again, I'm going to touch on this, but those se several variations, oh, sorry, um, training areas that I showed you will get into much deeper uh, concepts as well as the math. Uh, so I'd encourage you to do that if you have any interest as I go through this. So what we'll do is I'm just going to quickly cover the predictive life cycle. We'll go through the methodology map, which helps you select uh, what type of predictive analysis you're looking to do. I'll compare that to the tools that are available. We'll cover off two quick use cases, review the tools, and, and build out the actual models that will address those use cases. So I think this is quite obvious for a lot of you that are on um, you know, the predictive life cycle. So of course, before you do any level of prediction, you've got to have an understanding of your business, what it is that you're trying to predict, more importantly, why. And so if you've got that understanding of how your data relates, how your potential model will relate to your business, as well then your overall question, why are you asking it? Why are you working on it? And so if you've got a good handle on that, then naturally what you're going to do is you're going to understand, well, do I even have the data to be able to answer that question? And then if you find you've got the data, uh, then what you'll find is you're going to need an understanding of that data. So not just the fact that you have some numeric values and some classification uh, values or categorical value, but why? Um, what association do these two columns or, or data sets or large amounts of data sets have with each other? Um, and if you can gain that statistical understanding, if you will, of your data, then you know you can start to ask some complicated questions to be able to answer ultimately a question, a question which will help you predict, which will relate back to your business. So once you've got that understanding of your data, what you might find is there's going to be some level of data preparation that's required. Um, so this is kind of the life cycle I'm showing you in reality. These two steps take the most amount of time. First, finding where the data is, understanding if it's going to be able to help answer your question, but then cleaning that data, um, oftentimes massaging that data so you can ask questions of it. So these two uh, areas here will take a lot of your time if you can leverage all tricks, which a lot of our customers do to just even get to the preparation step, what you're going to find is you'll achieve some automation and then you'll be able to get into the modeling aspect. So we'll cover the modeling in greater detail, but once you've got your question, how it relates to your business, you've understood that you have the data, you've prepared and cleansed it, then what you'll find is you're going, you have many modeling methodologies available to your modeling types available to you. Then the question becomes, which one is the most appropriate to use? Not only which one is the most appropriate to use, but which model may have a higher accuracy than another, which in turn will help you uh, understand how well you can predict a certain set of values or a certain classification or category that you're looking to achieve. Then, of course, you're going to want to constantly evaluate that model. No business is constant. Things start to change over and over. We're in the largest change that I've ever seen in my life. And you need to understand how we can feed those changes into uh, your model so then you can adjust your evaluation so then it keeps and continuously supports your business and that overall question or set of questions you are asking. So moving from that into the methodology, again, you'll notice business problems. So once you've got a business problem, and I'm sure some of you have seen this slide before, um, then what you need to do is understand, are you going to start to analyze that uh, your data set to support what that problem is and potentially answer it? Or would you rather like to do some level of prediction? And so if, again, you have to do a data analysis to understand what your data is, what you're bringing in, how you can slice and dice it, only then when you have a great detail or a great handle on your data can you start to do some level of predictive. So I like to, I like to define predictive as identifying patterns of or occurrences within your data that can be uh, predicted into the future. So for example, if I have sales in my organization that are continuously affected by time of year, type of customer, type of product, and I can identify a set of patterns. And if I could do that confidently, then I can, with that much confidence, be able to predict how my sales might be affected tomorrow, one week from now, 
or uh, a month from now, or even throughout the year, depending on how well of a, a model that I build. Then um, as you're looking to build that predictive model, you're going to find that you are either data poor or data rich. So data poor might be you just don't have a large enough data set. Um, perhaps you have a decent amount of data, but it's not clean. There's a lot of nulls. So there's some level of fixing that you'll have to do to that data. So if you're data poor, um, what you're going to find is you're not going to be have a, a certain level of confidence or accuracy in trying to predict your outcome. In that case, there is a concept called A and B testing. I'm not going to dive into that in great detail, but A and B testing, it, it could be where you build out certain scenarios. So in a retail model, you might be adjusting prices of a particular product. Uh, perhaps you've never um, adjusted or come to a particular price for a product, so you want to know how will it behave. You may have an understanding of certain customers that are visiting your brick and mortar store or your online store. You may understand what segment they belong to. You may understand their historical purchase patterns, but you just don't know how well your product might behave if you were to set it at a certain price, higher or lower than what it has been in the past. So that's where you would leverage A and B testing to build out those scenarios and say, what if 100 customers of a particular segment came into my store? Are they likely to buy apples at a dollar or are they better off buying it at 50 cents? Um, so that's kind of your A and B testing methodology. What we're going to focus on is this classification and numeric, aka regression. Uh, so if you are data rich, uh, then what you're going to want to do is predict two types, I guess, um, of uh, models that you're going to build. So if it's classification, uh, it's going to be binary or non-binary. So for example, cl classification model or an example of that might be, is somebody going to respond to a particular marketing campaign? Is somebody about to leave my organization? Is somebody more likely to behave a certain way? Uh, perhaps you have those are kind of your binary yes or no's. Maybe you have some seasonal. Uh, I, I keep focusing on retail because I think it's the most, um, it's an industry we all understand regardless of where we work. But um, say I wanted to understand a seasonal trend on products that I was selling. So for example, I might be uh, better off selling t-shirts in the spring and summer. Uh, maybe I start marketing in the winter um, versus I might be able to sell my skis and snowboards uh, better off marketing kind of uh, early fall into winter. So those are your kind of classification uh, methods. Then numeric are continuous. So for example, I might want to understand back to my example of sales. What is my overall sales going to be within a department, within a uh, store, within a region? Uh, and that's going to be a continuous number. So sales are going to go up and down over uh, some time that I'm looking at them at. So that's a kind of question, a numeric continuous question. In other words, a regression. Um, model is most appropriate for predicting or answering that type of a question. Oops. And then we also have uh, forecasting tools as part of the predictive uh, tool pack. So we're not going to touch on those, but I can show you where to find them and what they're capable of. But forecasting exactly as the name suggests, excellent for, for forecasting budgets, again, sales, perhaps uh, visits to your website, whatever that might be. As long as you've got the data to support it, that would be a numeric regression kind of uh, uh, building a methodology. So I'll pause here for a second, see if there's any questions. Uh, no questions yet. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I've now just split this chart into a little bit more detail. I mean, I've, I've touched on a bunch of this, but if you are data rich, uh, what you're going to want to do is uh, either predict some sort of numeric value into the future or predict some sort of a outcome, yes or no's, or a particular season or a particular product type uh, that you're going to want to go ahead and predict, which will fall under classification. So uh, an even easier way to think about this, dollars and numbers, um, alpha, or alphanumeric or, or just text-based uh, prediction. Okay. Uh, we just have a quick question, but I can, I can answer this with a group. Uh, just where can we find this PowerPoint again? Uh, so via the recording, but what I will also do is perhaps I'll uh, send this out as a, as a PDF, as well as the two examples that I'm going to cover, and I'll package it all up and uh, share it with you folks after the session is done. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So uh, I think I've covered this already, so I'm just going to go uh, further into a set of examples. So where does what make sense? 
So in this case, if you were looking at re regression, in other words, continuous, in other words, numeric, here are some examples that you might uh, find yourself uh, or questions you might find yourself asking. So how much should we replenish the inventory of a particular SKU in a store? That's a numeric value. I want to understand that I should stock toilet paper in certain areas before an event like this occurs. Uh, how many support staff do I need to hire uh, to support a new client, for, perhaps? Classification is to which customers should we send a particular promotion? So this is one of my use cases I'm going to cover. I'm sure you've seen this in some of the uh, previous examples if you've attended. Uh, as well then, should we perhaps suspend credit to a particular customer? Perhaps identify fraud, perhaps identify a pattern in which we know that they're going to be a higher risk customer. So we might flag them as a high, medium, low risk. So that's a good example of a classification. Time series is what I uh, talked to you about the forecasting. So again, based on certain level of time, you want to predict your revenue uh, based on past performance. So for time series, you have to have very clean data. You have to have data at the level in which you're asking a question. So for example, if you're trying to predict tomorrow's sales, that would be daily sales. And so I have to have an understanding of my daily behavior into the past, whether it's two weeks, six months, or two years, I have to have it at that level. And if I've got it at daily, then I can roll that up and predict monthly and yearly. But if I have only annual values, I can't then predict what my sales might look like at the end of next month. So you have to make sure you, your data can support that level of analysis. As well, then A and B testing, uh, which I was showing you or talking about earlier. So things like, you know, how often or how long should your stores uh, be open? Uh, could we improve how we staff our stores to provide best, better customer service? Uh, how does price change impact bottom line? How can we increase profits through minor changes in our pricing? So again, these are questions, as you can probably imagine, are what if scenarios where you might not have all the ifs but you want to you have some of the ifs and you want to leverage that to come to some sort of a conclusion with a certain level of confidence to say although my data set wasn't complete i do think that we might take one way or the other okay so um while you go through that predictive training that i showed you earlier uh which was in the community i'm going to pull it up just to refresh your memory here this guy so under Academy Interactive uh, Lesson or Learning Path, what you'll find is there's a link to this PDF document. I've just taken a screen cap of it and put it here. And although it doesn't cover all the Alteryx uh, predictive tools, it does give you an idea of if you were trying to do a yes or no classification analysis, which tools might be the best? Um, are they easy to interpret? Uh, what are their, some of their limitations? How long do might take to run? As well, then, if you were doing regression, you know, on the uh, left-hand side here, these are several tools available or most appropriate for regression test. As well, then, in the middle here, you'll you'll see it's kind of highlighted in blue, are a bunch of tools that can go either way. So I would encourage you to take a look at this document in greater detail. I'm not going to go through it, but um, when you're asking yourself questions as to which tools are the best or most appropriate to determine or answer your question is a good uh, indicator, a good starting point, I'd recommend to you. Hey, uh, Hassan, um, quick question for numerical output, such as whether, did you, sorry, did you just answer that one? When is it better to predict than forecast and vice versa? So uh, I think it's better to predict than to forecast. So for forecast, I would, I would rely on more um, kind of numeric, very, when you have data that you can slice and dice is very rich, and it's more probable that it's a uh, uh, currency uh, value that you're trying to predict, then I would say forecasting tools might be better, but you could very well achieve the same result leveraging the predictive tools in the regression testing. I think forecasting, if you're looking at financial numbers, it just makes it a little bit easier. As well then there are two forecasting methods, which is a, a science of its own the ARIMA, and I believe the other one was, I forget these names, if I remember all of this, I'd lose my mind. Um, ETS and ARIMA model. So there's a whole uh, branch of science that goes into how you predict um, financial or, or forecast versus some predictive uh, regression, which might get you to the same answer, but I'd say that's more appropriate for say weather uh, versus uh, revenue. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm touching it lightly. 
hope it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, thanks, Bruno. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so here are two use cases we're gonna uh, quickly touch on. So the first one is I have a set of data and what we're trying to do is the issue that we have at hand is we're trying to understand based on that set of data, could we predict how much a certain household would spend on eating out? So this is a regression model. Not only are we going to predict that the set of people are eating out, but then we want to predict how much they would spend on a given time basis on uh, how much they would spend on eating out. Uh, so our goal then is to build a model that predicts out of home dining, we're gonna score it. And then we understand that predicting is not always 100% accurate. So then what we'll also do is calculate a particular gap as to what we predicted, what historically a customer did spend, and then what the gap is to give us an idea of, although we might be able to predict how much we might be off by. And so we'll do that. And then the second use case is we have a set of data where we know how our customers had behaved with our retail um, business in the past. And we have one particular field in there, which tells us in the last time we promoted to them, they, whether or not they responded to our promotion. And so we're gonna see if we can maybe use that data, the historical data and identify some patterns and leverage it to see what customers or how customers might behave if we were to send them a future promotion. And so if I can bring this back into business terms, um, when you when our organizations develop promotions, that's a lot of dollars, whether it's print media, online media, um, you know, television media, there's a lot of money associated with, hey, go ahead and promote to 100 people versus 100,000 people. So what we wanna do is do this level of predictive analysis to say, hey, it might make sense based on this promotion to only predict the 2,000 people in certain regions because they are 80% more likely to bite into that promotion versus doing a spaghetti on the wall approach where you waste you know, hundreds of thousands or likely case millions of dollars trying to predict the customers that are just simply going to ignore your, your marketing campaign or promotion. All right, so uh, the key concepts we'll cover is a linear regression tool, uh, scoring, a decision tree, a logistic regression tool, as well then um, we'll show you quickly how you can compare several models. So not often uh, will you find yourself in a situation where you've dropped in one or two, or sorry, one predictive tool, and you think you've you know, created the best particular model. There's no way to say it's the best model or the most accurate unless you try some other methods. And then if you're trying various methods, and of course you're going to want to compare it to see which one, or a set of um, models are better than, than others. So we'll cover the model comparison tool as well. So just getting into logistic regression, this is a particular tool uh, that you would leverage for binary yes or no's. Uh, as you can see, there's a little bit of a curve here, which tells me, and the curve represents the icon, the type of analysis, which tells me that I cannot draw a straight line and identify patterns, but I can see that my expected values are perhaps influenced by a set of other values. And so if I'm doing a yes or no, uh, here are the reports that I can interpret. So I've got everything from my mins, my medians, as well then I've got my estimate, standard value, and p-values, which we'll dive into when I'm in the tool. So this is a logistic regression, uh, best use for classification. A logistic regression, as this icon indicates, you can see that there's a a bunch of points within a graph, and then I can, with certainty, draw a line across my occurrences and identify um, the most common kind of scenario. So I can identify my outliers, and then I can identify where my most dense um, data sets are when they're plotted on a chart. And then I can say, hey, if every if a lot of my population or my my data behaves a certain way, then I can cut a line through it. And then so tomorrow I can predict what this might be. So again, this is a report that comes out of the logistic regression tool. And you know, your mins, your medians, your standard deviation, your p-values are all here. So again, I told you I'm not going to teach you math, so I can't get into what a standard deviation might mean uh, for a particular set. But what you will find is these, these reporting tools will guide you along the way. So I can see here my significance codes. So I can see the closer I am to a a zero value in my p-value, the more influence I may have in predicting a certain uh, field, in this case, a responder. So I can 
from this report see that the miles uh, or the distance miles, meaning the the area somebody has to travel to come into my store, uh, is looks like somewhat significant here uh, versus whether they're a customer for one to three years or five years. Okay. So decision tree model is what we'll also cover here. You have uh, again a yes or no. Uh, so total spend distance somebody travels distance plus what they spend so you'll get a whole bunch of whys uh, in term, or, or trees so three uh, outputs that come out of this report the model itself a statistic report which will show you the tree an interactive report which will allow you to interact with some variables within your uh, model and understand and be able to answer um, why you've arrived to a certain decision so something i gloss over completely we're all talking about machine learning and predictive models um, but when we do and we build something out, these are often still experiments, good experiments, but still experiments. So when you boiled up your value to a uh, dashboard or a metric or decisions being made on what you're predicting, somebody somewhere is going to ask you how you're arriving there. And so you have to be able to support your decision. And the reason why I'm talking about these reports and interactive reports is when you're asked that question, when you're leveraging Alteryx Designer, not only do you have a lineage, but you have proof as to why you decided one model was better than the other, how it arrived to a predictive value, uh, and you can trace it all back down. So you confidently not only be able to provide models, but then be able to answer why they're happening a certain way. Okay, so the last thing we'll cover is a model comparison. I'm not gonna get into all that, uh, except what you want to understand is the ROC chart which will give you um, your models over a, a particular chart saying, if there's no model, this is what we're expecting to see. Uh, if there is a certain model, and what you wanna look out for is a 90 degree. So if I had a perfect 90 degree line, which tells me I've with great certainty been able to predict um, accurately what my values are. And then if I flatlined, then say I flatlined at 80%, I'm at 80% accuracy across my data set as I continue on. So if I have a line like this, what I'd probably pick is the yellow line. The yellow line here is a stepwise model, and that seems to be the most accurate for what I'm trying to predict. Again, ROC, something I'd encourage you to kind of take a look at why an ROC chart and how you would interpret it and how why it's important to you when you're building out models. So now that brings me to the end of my PowerPoint presentation here. So what I'll do is let's dive into this regression model that we're going to build out. Again, I promised you simplicity. So what I have here is what we're trying to predict again, if you recall, is how much a particular household would spend uh, eating out of their home. So what I've got here is some sort of an ID that identifies this particular record. So it could be a customer ID. I have a historical understanding of how much they've spent outside eating out. Um, I have some income information, I have some age information. I then also have some level of education. Uh, so this could be a, perhaps we can leverage this to build out a segmentation. This could be the segmentation itself. As well, then I have an idea of the size of a family. So how much will somebody spend away, spend outside of their home in eating uh, if they're one uh, household versus a four? So I don't know, um, I'm on one household, I spend a lot of money eating outside, but had I uh, some kids, perhaps I would spend differently. Maybe I'd spend more because I'm busy working. And so when I come home, I don't have time to cook. So these are the type of things that you can start to, uh, type of things that you want to understand about your data so that you can feed it into models and understand could you use it or not to be able to predict what you're predicting. As well then I have some family. Yes, Hassan, sorry, it's, uh, we've got a couple questions here sure. that just popped up, and I um, apologize, guys, I'm about a minute behind on these ones. Uh, but the, uh, what model do I use to forecast monthly equipment failure incident if I have over three years historical data? What would be ideal for that? That's a good question. So I can't give you 110% answer on that, but what I would tell you is come in and try to use these time series because if you're looking at equipment failure and it's over a certain amount of time and you've got the granular, granular level of data, perhaps you can leverage 
the time series to come out and see if that'll answer your question because it's a time-based question. In this case that I'm looking at, although I'm trying to predict a numerical value, you'll notice I don't have time here. So I can't leverage the forecasting tools. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, hope that helps, Paul. Um, just one other one. Uh, when, uh, when do you consider R squared value and when to consider F score value to tell about the accuracy of the model? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. And so I will tell you, uh, come out and take a look at this training path and it will tell you when the best or most accurate, uh, uh, when you want to look at R squared or F squared and to determine accuracy. Because that's a loaded question. It could be on your data, the models that you're using, what it is that you're trying to predict, all that. So I would tell you to go ahead and take a look at the um, the training and it would with better certainty that I can tell you which model might be or which unit might be better to look at for accuracy. Yeah, we're good with that. All right, so I just looked at the time. It's 1.43 Eastern here, so I've got to kind of speed it up. So I'm going to, but um, please do stop me and ask me questions as uh, you have them. All right, so taking a look at this data, again, I've got some uh, uh, additional characteristics of whether or not somebody's got kids, what the family structure is, are they in an urban area or not, uh, as well then, do they have a college degree or how many children? So what you'll notice is here I had this uh, bachelor's degree, for example, here, we've taken that into a, a binary value, so zeros and ones. So whether somebody has a degree versus not, perhaps that's important. Then we can also see uh, whether or not somebody's got children. So no children, a zero, six to one, one, 12 to 17, one. Maybe their age doesn't matter. I just need to know household with children or, or without. So now that we've done some level of preparation, what you'll notice is if I continue on with my, my analysis here, I have some null values. Uh, as well. So if I hit the input anchor of this imputation tool, you'll notice I've got some null values on income. So if I fed my data like this into the linear regression tool, it would error out. The reason being income is a predictor that I want to leverage. And if it's null, it's going to stop here and say, well, I have no idea. So either get rid of that record or put in some sort of a value. So I had a choice to make. If I had a lot of my income column empty or null. In other words, I couldn't use it to be able to predict or add any level of value in my predictive model, then maybe I would have taken uh, it out completely. But because it's numeric and because I have my data sets pretty complete, only 3% of my um, rows in the income field are null, what I decided to do instead was leverage this imputation tool, which you'll find in the preparation category. So what I did here was I said, okay, um, wherever there might be a missing dollar value and how much somebody spent outside, as well then if you have missing income value, what I'd like to do is replace the null with an average. I could have done a median. I can also say, hey, wherever there's null value, let's just assume an X number. I don't wanna do that. So I leverage the average. So having done that, then what I did was in the preparation category, uh, what you'll find is the create samples tool. So this is a tool I highly recommend you bring into your analysis if you're doing predictive, because what it will do um, based on what you provide here was, is it can take, in my case, 70% of my historical data set and use it to teach my model. And then it will hold 30% of my data set to then, which we're then going to use to validate the model. So this is a great way to split your data and teach it on a large set of it, but then hold some values so you can validate and see whether or not you're accurate in your model that you're developing. Hey, Hassan, quick question. Uh, what percentage of, of null values are enough to completely disregard the column? Uh, that'll depend on your kind of data, but a rough estimate is if there's anywhere from 70 to 80% of your values are null or missing, that's a useless field, get rid of it. Now, even at 50-50, for example, if I had 50% of my values here that were filled in, 50 null, if I imputed them, I would have, yes, I would have put in some numbers to fill in the remaining 50%, uh, but how accurate would that be in reality? And if it's not going to be that accurate, in other words, I'm just leveraging a, an average, then it's up to me to decide, you know, is that going to help me any or or not, right? So. 
it's not black and white answer, but the rough estimate 70, 70 to 80 percent of your data is missing. Get rid of it. Okay, we got a couple. Follow, we got a couple follow-ups for that. But there are times when imputation does not help at all. That I guess that was more of a statement than anything. Um, That's accurate. Then, yeah, and then would you split the data? Is that common practice? 70-30? 70 to 30. Yeah, 70-30 rule or 80-20 rule is a good practice. Again, Thank depending you. on how, how large your data set is. If you're only feeding it a thousand records, um, you know, first of all, I'd argue is a thousand even going to teach anything. Um, but in certain cases it can. Right? All right, so uh, 147 now. So why don't we, guys, if you don't mind, uh, hold the questions for now, unless it's something very urgent. Uh, and then let me run through this and I'll ask, answer your questions uh, towards the end, I'll hang on. All right, so in this case, I leverage a linear regression tool. Uh, what you will find that is in the predictive tool set. If you're not seeing as many tools that I have, uh, that means you do not have the Alteryx predictive tool pack installed. To do that, if you don't see these many tools, head to options down here. It's not showing for me because I have it. You'll see download predictive tool. Simply click on that, follow the instructions. And then once you've got it downloaded, not only will you get all these tools, You'll also get the data investigation tools as well then the time series forecasting tools and a whole bunch of others actually predictive and prescriptive. All right, coming back to linear regression, you'll find it here. So again, if I just read the description, uh, it creates a simple model to estimate the values or evaluates relationships between variables based on a linear relationship where you can cut that line. So um, now that I've got the linear regression, I can select what it is that I want to predict. So in this case, food away is what I want to predict. And then if I scroll down, I have all the variables or features that I can start to include to be able to predict. So of course, this example, before I came to the conclusion that these are the columns or features that are going to help me, I of course should have and would have gone through selecting a bunch of them, determining the results, seeing what's more closely uh, associated or which has an impact on food away. Uh, and then I would have filtered down to the best variables or features that support what it is that I'm trying to predict. So in this case, we've come to the conclusion that income, someone's age, family size, and then the old child flag, as well as whether or not they live in an urban area or not, are the best variables to predict how much they would spend eating out. So once I hit run on that, what you'll notice is there's three out anchors, an O, R, and I. O is the actual object or the model. So if I click on that, you'll notice it just has a name as well as an object represented in size. It doesn't tell me anything, but that's what I'm going to feed into my score tool. Then I have an R and an I flag. So here I put a browse tool to the R to then interpret my report uh, and understand uh, what it is that I'm looking at. So I'll click on the report section here. What I was showing you earlier, I can see my my coefficients, for example. So I'm trying to predict food away. Looks like someone's income seems to be a pretty good predictor. Uh, as well then, if I scroll down here, uh, perhaps whether or not they're in an urban environment um, is a little less of a predictor. I can scroll down further and see uh, my response table if I wanted to in significant codes there. As well then, what I like is the interactive report. So if I click on the interactive report, it's going to now give me my R squared values, my absolute values, as well as some charts here, which I can reference to say, hey, income seems, you'll notice same data as a static R report, but this is a little bit more interactive. So I can say, hey, I want to see the P values. I want to see them here. Uh, as well, then you can see your model performance. So I can see I've got a bit of a cluster here. So my actuals versus my predicted values. And then as I uh, go further up, um, you know, I see some outliers, but I can comfortably based on this cluster set a line, which then will give me some level of prediction, maybe not as accurate as I move further up. Then I have a his histogram as well, if I wanted to see that. If you're, lever if you're looking to diagnose your models, you'll find, so by the way, if this is a little annoying, what you'll notice is there's a plus sign here. So you can open this up in a new window. And then instead of having to fidget with um, the configuration tab, you can then leverage this uh, window to then go and interpret your results. So I can see my residuals versus fitted values, my QQ plot 
I don't even know what that means. And then my residuals versus leverage. So I'm confidently telling you, I don't know what that means because I'm not a data scientist. I am not a statistician either. So I did not go to school to learn this. However, I did go to school to understand data. I did go to school to, or, or over my experience, understand how to leverage these tools. And what I can do is with a certain level of uh, competency and accuracy, I can conduct these experiments to come to some sort of a result, which then I can leverage to go and talk to somebody who is a data scientist or who is a statistician and say, I'm onto something, I think I found something, and they would potentially then help me further. Or because of this tool, I can get a lighter level of understanding and then uh, build upon my knowledge, which I'm suggesting to you by using those predictive uh, courses that are available to you for free to then say, okay, now I understand the math behind it. And with a greater level of certainty, I can go out and tell my business how to behave based on what I've predicted. All right. So uh, say we've, we've done these experiments. Uh, let's just pretend we went through this over and over. It's been a rigorous process. We did the whole um, uh, cycle, the, uh, the predictive cycle. And now we've arrived to the fact that we want to leverage this model and we want to start to score it. So in the predictive tool set, you'll find a score tool. So what the score tool will do is it'll allow you to give your data as well as a model you just generated, and then be able to score with some level of confidence as to what your desired predictive outcome is. So if I zoom in here, you'll notice there's a D and an M tag. D is being fed by the validation so that V, the 20, 30% of data that I held back, I'm going to now use it to validate my model the model being fed from the O out anchor into the M input anchor of the score tool. So if I click on the out anchor now of the score tool, what I'll get is two new columns, actually one new column in this case called score. And what you'll notice is that score is now giving me, I'm trying to zoom in here, uh, some sort of numeric value. So in this case, for this particular household, I've determined that they will spend 1,000 uh, $205 eating out. And then, so if I compare that to what they actually spend, it was 694. So I'm almost double. So perhaps then I, this gives me an understanding that I have to fine tune my model a little bit further. Then if I scroll down further, let's see here, I predicted 676 that they're gonna spend and they actually spent 87. So it looks like I'm over predicting perhaps. Uh, let's see here, they spend 2100. If I scroll over here, I'm under predicting. Uh, and I'm saying they're only going to spend 124. So like I mentioned before, your models will not be accurate, but you'll want to do this level of analysis to see what do you have to fine tune a little bit further to be able to get to a more accurate score. So if I just look at my browse tool here, here we did put in a formula to measure the gap. And now I have an understanding of my gap, how, uh, how much I've gone over or under in the predictive value based on the actual results uh, based on history. So you can use that to then fine tune your model. With five minutes remaining, I'm gonna go away from the regression to this classification model now. So what I'm doing in the classification model is I'm leveraging a decision tree and a logistic regression. Uh, you'll notice I have my sample set here. So in this case, the annotation says 50-50, don't do that. Um, what I'm doing in this case is I'm doing 80-20, uh, 80 to uh, teach my models, 20 to validate. And so the data set that I have here is I've got uh, my customer, an understanding of who they are, how much they spend with me, where they live, uh, as well then whether or not they've responded to me with a positive or negative response in the past, as well as some other information like their household income, uh, the population in the area in which they live and so forth. So leveraging those, what I could do is build a classification model. So I brought in a decision tree. What I want to predict is responder. So whether or not they'll respond to me. And what I believe is gonna be important is how much they've spent, how many transactions they've made with me, the segmentation they belong to, and then how much that household uh, earns. As well, then I'm, I'm bringing in a logistic regression tool. And you'll notice I've set it up the exact same way. And so the reason why I've done that is perhaps I want to determine based on these two, which one is the most accurate model to leverage. So to do that, um, what I can do is take my O, object from here, object from here, and then I've hidden my lines, but I'm unioning it together. So if I looked at the outer anchor of the union, I have my decision tree, its object, my uh, logistic regression, and its object. 
which then I'm feeding into this model comparison tool. So the model comparison tool really is an R-based tool. You can find it here. I just popped this thing open. Probably shouldn't do this with three minutes remaining, but uh, what it will do is take my models and leverage uh, this R code, which you can come out and modify if you wanted to, uh, and then give me some sort of a report, which will eventually, what I'm interested in is my ROC curve. And so it's going to now give me an understanding of the two models, how accurate one is over the other. I see they're quite accurate. Logistic regression seems to be just a tad bit more. Um, and however, it is better at predicting no's than it is predicting yeses. And yeses is what I'm interested in. So maybe I decide I want to use a decision uh, tree versus a logistic regression. Again, up to you to decide. Here's proof that will give you um, an understanding of why choose one over the other. So I can see here, based on the ROC curve, that the logistic regression is better off predicting my true values versus my false values than the decision tree is. So I might decide I want to use the logistic regression. So based on that, uh, again, I can come and interpret my, my static and R-based report, or I can touch on my interactive report and get that level of understanding of how level, how accurate, how precise, as well then my confusion table, which I can come in and determine whether or not this model is any good in predicting my values. So say it is, I've leveraged the same score tool, to, which then is giving me two new columns in this case, a score no and a score yes, and it's giving me confidence values. So here I predict that this person will not respond with a 90% accuracy. So they did respond in the past, so perhaps it gives me an opportunity to understand whether or not I need to further fine tune my model. Uh, if I come down here and say with 45% you know, accuracy, I determined that they are going to respond and they did not. Again, that could have gone either way. So uh, it gives me an idea that my model is not as accurate, so I have to be careful. But what I can do is further see if I have any values where I was 80% or greater confident in how they were going to respond. So in this case, I have nine records where I was. And so with an 83% accuracy, I said they were, yes, going to respond, and they did in the past. Here, though, this person did not respond in the past, but with 99% accuracy, I thought they would. So of course, there's going to be some instances like this, but you can determine which confidence level you want to trust, whether 70%, 80%, or 95%. So having said that, with a minute left, I know I rushed through the end here. Well, I'll share with you my slides. I'll share with you these completed workflows uh, as well. Then we'll share with you the recording. But I'll pause here uh, and see if I know there's a bunch of questions, whatever we can address. Uh, and then feel free to shoot me an email as well um, if you have some additional questions. So, Sean, anything here? Yeah, so I, there's a couple we've weeded that uh, kind of an answer, but not, or uh, we've kind of glossed over, which is fine. Um, just with so many categories, and this is the most frustrating situation ever, could you please suggest something better than label encoding and one hot encoding? Um, the easy answer to that is leverage the data investigation tools, leverage the association analysis, the contingency table, as well perhaps a scatter plot to understand which variables are the most um, influential in what you're trying to predict, which then you can you know fine tune, figure out those uh, features or variables, and then select the appropriate ones in your Tool set. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you because we went through a fair amount uh, quickly at the end there. Uh, is it possible that the model gives drastically different results depending on the the random data split? Uh, potentially, but if I have a large enough data set and I've covered the most amount of variables, I shouldn't see too much of a difference. But yes, depending on how much data you're feeding it, it will learn slightly differently, and then so you could have uh, charts where they might be a little different, but not too different. Um, okay. Um, uh, so actually, Sean, I'll have to stop here. Uh, I'm one minute over. I'm, uh, I've got another meeting now. I apologize, folks, but, um, shoot us some, uh, you've got Sean's email. Um, you've got my email. Shoot us some questions as you have them, but I encourage you to go and take a look at the, uh, predictive, uh, education that we have available for you. Great. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks to Sean for running the session today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody. Thanks everyone.